to welcome all of you to uh, Wisdom from Our Neighborhood, which is a broadcast of Paths to Understanding, formerly Neighbors in Faith and the Tracy Levine Center. Our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. Uh, tonight, I'm so happy to have uh, in conversation with me uh, two friends of mine, uh, the Reverend Danae Ashley, who's the Associate Rector at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Seattle, Washington, and a licensed family therapist with a private practice at Soul Spa Seattle, whose offices are in Shoreline. Born in Spokane, she served parishes in North Carolina, New York, and Minnesota. Welcome, Danae. Thank you. Glad to be here. And then also, uh, Rachel Tabor Hamilton is the rector of Trinity Episcopal Church in Everett, Washington. Rachel was raised in a mixed race heritage of First Na Nations, uh, Chacon in BC, Pennsylvania Dutch, and Scotch Irish. She has 25 years of experience in working with diverse communities, served as a chaplain in a hospital setting, and helped organizations recover from community and organizational trauma. Rachel, Hi. welcome. Glad to be with you. Thank you so much. And just to all of you who may be listening live this evening, either on Zoom uh, or on Facebook Live, if you're on Zoom, please feel free to send us a question for Rachel or Danae uh, or myself and uh, in the Q&A feature. If you're on watching on Facebook, please feel free to, to comment uh, in the Facebook Live section and we'll make sure we, we get the, those, questions, uh, those questions answered and asked. So first of all, um, we've just been asking while COVID-19 is taking place, and just kind of marking uh, how we're all progressing and, and moving through this time. How are your family, you and your families doing? Uh, Rachel, how about you? Well, I, you know, I think that my husband who's retired is actually enjoying the reasons to stay home, to catch up on a lot of things. So he's been keeping himself impressively active and, and keeping both he and I very conscious of all the ways that we need to wear the PPE when we're out in public. That's great. Uh, Danae, how about you? Uh, so what I've been telling clients and what I, the bar that I've been holding for myself is, hey, I got up this morning and so did my husband. We may be wearing pants <laughs> and that is a good day. So it's it's been it's been intense. Uh, my work as a therapist and as a, someone who's a leader in a church has not stopped. So I'm working differently and equally long hours. My husband's a professional musician and he is out of work, and that is really really difficult for anyone that is based in the gig economy. So um, yeah, there's good things and, and bad things. We adopted a dog that has helped helped with some of the the anxiety and, and a place to put our care, but yeah, day by day. All yeah, I know we, we uh, you know, so my wife's a physical therapist and she just began some uh, work this last week, uh, working uh, two half days a week. And, and that's been interesting uh, finding that, uh, you know, go to, go to, go to the hospital and then come home and, and uh, change clothes in the garage and package all that up and then take it directly to the wash and do a shower right away. And, just trying to be, be extra extra careful. I know a few weeks ago, I was experiencing some innovation exhaustion. Mm. You know, just kind of like, I, I just can't find one more new way to do things. And and yet uh, this, last, this last week or so has been better. Like we're finding more of a pattern. Uh, but then of course, you know, our care and concern for those that are, that are less fortunate in this co context are really heavily weighing, I'm sure, on all of us. And uh, yeah. we'll, we'll get into more of that um, as we go through the conversation. Um, so Ronald Heifetz um, from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University says that people don't fear change, uh, they fear loss. Um, what are some of the examples of losses people are experiencing right now? Danae, you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. The, the main thing that I am noticing with clients, with parishioners, with the world is ambiguous loss. And that is that, that liminal time where you are not what you were and you're not what you're going to be and you don't know when you're going to be there. And there's so much about the uncertainty of that time that it creates a lot of anxiety and a lot of loss because the anchors that we typically hold for ourselves 
have been washed away. So we're having to figure out where do we anchor ourselves in this, this time that's like a fog. And that's, that's a lot of the underlying layer of, of loss that surrounds us all. Um, you mentioned, I think you called it innovation, but I, I've been saying adaptation fatigue. Yeah. That's part of the ambiguous loss, always trying to adjust. You know, just when you think you have your footing, then you don't. And that's really difficult for folks to navigate. Uh, and then the, the very personal losses. You know, if, you, if you've had a death in the family, um, my, my beloved dog died right, like the day before COVID went crazy. And I'm still dealing with that very personal grief. But there's other things, job loss, you know, um, if you already had a health crisis, you know, if you have cancer or something like that, having to get those treatments, how are you going to do that? Loss of, of, uh, of the, the way that we used to do things, all, all of that, just I, I see it everywhere. Loss of how we do church, you know, or how we do our faith community or any kind of community, really. Those, those points of connection that we thought we could rely on don't seem to be as sure as we thought they were. Yeah, you know that that uh, that term you you threw out. I think that actually was the term I've been using. I just couldn't find it tonight. Adaptation fatigue. Yeah, we're all tired. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Ra Rachel, what do you think about the losses people are experiencing right now? What are you seeing in terms of those losses? Well, I was stunned when we had our very first virtual vestry meeting, for example, uh, when all this started. And I just asked everyone to do a check-in and they really were very representative, I think, of uh, the spectrum. Uh, one woman who has an intergenerational household, so she's grandmother, sharing with her kids and grandkids. She's in the basement in a nice, you know, suite downstairs, but she has to talk to her grandchildren by sort of conversations up and down the stairs and they stay in their respective spaces. So just the, even the loss of the physicality of being present um, to precious grandchildren and needed uh, elders and things. And then in the tribal sense um, of my friends in Navajo Nation, uh, I think something very similar is happening at the very times when people uh, want to come together uh, and support one another and be with elders and be with family. They are getting the message strong and clear that they really cannot do that. And they're getting it not only from um, the CDC people or healthcare people, they're getting it from their tribal leadership. So I, I think there's a, a loss of just uh, the normative sort of comforts and support and trying to figure out how um, to, to, to be there for people um, in, in these most critical and traumatic times. So, so everything that Danae was reflecting, job loss is reflected, uh, the loss of self-understanding if we've lost a job, and, and that's represented even on my vestry. So people just really looking around for what is identity, what is community, what is family, mm -hmm. this, that's all been lost. Yeah, so, and then part of this as well is, is all of the, you know, so we're, we're, we're not able to access the normal patterns of behavior, the relationships, the friendships, hey, let's, let's go down to the, to the bar and, and, uh, and have a beer together or have a soda together or something, can't, can't go to coffee with folk normally. Um, so all that's kind of missing for us, but what we do have a lot of time for is watching the news <laughs> or listening to the news or reading the news. And, and I, I keep wondering about how news and information is impacting people uh, in this pandemic uh, kind of circumstance. Uh, Rachel, how about, what do you think? Well, definitely at, in this time, we're really still in the midst of a trauma event. Mm -hmm. As families, as community, as nation, and, and global worldview, we're in the midst of it. And so the, the stresses and the anxiety that we're feeling are very normative to that. So then when you add layer upon layer on, on top of that, we're already trying to do the best we can. And those of us who have uh, coping mechanisms that can kind of meet a normative layer of stress now have multiple layers of stress added on of complexity of how to even get um, healthcare needs met 
People aren't going to their ERs. People aren't even able to access their normal physicians. So yeah, listening to the news just adds that another layer and, and energizes all of that. So some of the advice I'm giving to people is really to monitor and not be too obsessive <laughs> on following all, all the news media. If you have to turn it off, give yourself a break, keep informed, but really take those breaks, especially on social media. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would echo that. I, I've been telling clients to, to have what I, what I call like a healthy media diet, just like our own nutrition. What, what we bring in affects what we're going to put out. Right. So, um, limiting time. I I'm even saying 30 minutes max for like the whole day and only reliable news sources, not scrolling through Facebook or other kinds of social media for your news, but, but reliable things, you know, uh, as the local, you know, Washington state department of health, the CDC, that kind of stuff where you're going to get reliable news and really limiting that so that you can manage your anxiety around it. Cause there's so much, I, I feel like there's so many things that are, people are writing and, and people are putting out there that I think they're trying to help but it ends up ratcheting up your anxiety instead of being helpful. Yeah. Well, and, and let's, you know, let's maybe be, be clear here with ourselves. I mean, too, that, that you know, we're talking about a virus that has a, a fairly high rate of both communicability um, and significant health and even mortality, you know, higher, much higher rate than normal. So, you know, the thing that we're afraid of is, is that we're, we're afraid that we could die. Mm -hmm. Right. We're afraid that our loved ones could die. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, I mean, that, that strikes right at the heart. And so what that does, at least in my mind, okay, you two can ther therapize me, can be my therapist here for a minute. But what it does for me is it makes me want to attend to all the news, mm -hmm. both in terms of health impacts, but also in terms of the economy and in terms of, you know, jobs and the, and, and it makes me want to attend to all these so, and then my motivation underneath that, of course, is to survive, right? But then what happens when that, that desire to survive, to take an information that's going to help me and my family do that, then begins to work the other way, work, begins to work against me? Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 uh, Danae, do you mind? I, I was going to just say to that, that uh, you, you really struck something in terms of just our visceral response that we have millennia of evolution to do. We when we see a danger coming at us, we have all these wonderful chemicals dumped through our brain and bodies that contribute to how we're responding and mm -hmm. up and, and contribute to fueling that anxiety physically. So, so yeah, the, the survival instinct is clear and it really does take that sort of uh, prefrontal cortex to process the information uh, and sift through, like Danae was saying, you know, what is sensible, helpful, real information and what is simply driving that hindbrain to a place of um, e extremists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when we continue to live in that place of fight, flight, or freeze, that, that's, our, that's our reptilian brain. That's not our executive function brain. And so it's almost like it, in, our, in our Christian tradition, you know, we're about to, we're, we're about to celebrate um, the Feast of the Ascension. And it's like, if the disciples just stood and looked and watched Jesus and, and were still looking after he was gone and like not paying attention to what was going around them. And that's kind of what it feels like. It's like, oh, we're going to look over here, but not pay attention to what's right in front of us, which is what we can actually control. So does that, if that makes sense. Yeah, Very, somebody said to me, how come you're not more upset uh, about what you're seeing? And I said, well, would that help? Mm-hmm. It, 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 because that, that won't help. And, and so we just have to kind of ask the question, what's the most helpful thing right now? And, and it might just simply be having a conversation uh, of sharing how we're feeling and then recognizing what is it that we can control? Because a lot of the anxiety, like you said, is about what we can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that goes back to what Danae was saying at, at, at the top, that that part of the loss that we're having is is having a future that we can feel that we can reliably predict mm -hmm. and of course we can never really predict the future anyway right but we are we have kind of lost this sense that like well the government's gonna more or less work 
mm -hmm. right? And the health system is going to more or less work. And I'm going to be able to go to work. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and, right. And all of a sudden, like, you know, I, I can reliably expect that my 401k or whatever, if I have, if I'm lucky enough to have one, is going to let me retire at some point or that mm -hmm. the social security system is going to function. Mm -hmm. And and now I think all of those, all, all the kind of institutional fears and doubts that we had before are also being kind of magnified in a way that make us feel less secure about the future, a future that where we have to rely on other people. Yeah. We have yeah. to rely on systems. And I think that's a lot of the, of the fear that at least that I'm carrying um, in yeah. these days as I'm watching myself process all this. Yeah. yeah. And, and I've heard also onto that, building what you're saying, uh, in terms of that generational family, there, the fear around if, if grandparents, adult children are not able to have income, if they get the virus because of their exposure, then the whole jeopardy of that older generation about what happens to their future that they were relying upon as well. Um, it, so, so yeah, I, I think there, there's just layering of it all. And you're, I, I love what you said about the things that we thought we could rely upon, even in terms of the social or institutional constructs, are also part of what is experiencing the trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and going on that too, what I've talked with a lot of my clients about and with other people is, you know, before a couple has a baby, I tell them, you need to get things figured out that, you know, communication, conflict resolution before this baby comes because it will break wide open whatever cracks are already in your relationship. <laughs> and so on a societal level, yeah. you know, these cracks that were already there and we were aware of them or maybe hiding them or denying them are broken wide open on a large mm -hmm. level. And then we look at the, the microcosm of family, whatever way that is shaped whatever cracks are there now or were before are even more uh, exposed and it's very raw. And so people, you know, being sheltered in place and having this rawness, uh, it, it creates a lot of, of anxiety and sadness and fear. And I think what we're seeing with you know, Danae talking about, yeah, if there was already dysfunction in a relationship or a family unit, and now you're kind of stuck in this quarantine sheltering it, in place situation, uh, we know we're seeing on the national level increase of um, domestic abuse and, and domestic home violence uh, as a part of that. The stress has nowhere else to go. Uh, people who are able to kind of maybe manage or find a way to survive in that are, are now really in peril. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we have all these layers of stress and I, I and so how, as people kind of monitor their own behavior, you know, as we're kind of looking at ourselves or we're looking at family or friends uh, that we're in contact with, you know, one way or another, what are some of the signs of stress uh, that, of kind of stress that's kind of getting to be a little bit out of control? What are some things people could be looking at uh, in terms of, of their, their or other people's behavior? Uh, I I would say that grief in general, a lot of people don't recognize it when it's appearing, especially if it's not something really specific, like, you know, my mother died and I know that that happened. Yeah. When it's these, the ambiguous loss and other types of loss that people don't think, well, it's, it wasn't a death, so how is that a loss? That is the type of grief that comes out sideways and you see it in anger and irritability at things that you normally would not be angry or irritable about, or you would be able to manage them better. Um, listlessness, not having motivation, uh, not being able to sleep, having you know, too much sleep, crying unexpectedly. You know, I know someone who, you know, was out, who went to get, reached for a can of soup in the, in the cupboard and just started crying and they're like, what's wrong with me? Um, <laughs> all these kind of unexpected coming out sideways ways uh, of grief. That's, that's what I am getting from people. What are you seeing, Rachel? Well, I'm seeing people really struggling with, they recognize that maybe one of the things that's happening for them is they tend to 
be even more trying to isolate. Maybe that was one of their grief coping mechanisms or stress coping me mechanisms before. And now that, that's already happened, they're isolated. So, so they're trying to figure out how do they get the help they need uh, when they're recognizing that maybe that is not an effective coping mechanism right now. And other things to kind of look for is, you know, uh, how are they doing? Are they able to keep exercising or are they really kind of slowing down and, and not wanting to go outside or deal with it at all? And they forget about health. How are they eating? How, uh, um, how are they doing with the alcoholic beverages? <laughs> how yeah, that was another thing I, yeah, <laughs> you know, and just kind of keeping tabs on, on, the, um, are, does the retreat looks like self care or does the retreat look like denial and, and really non effective coping? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So if if we if we uh, if we see that that kind of stress that kind of those kind of behaviors starting to take place for ourselves, um, how do you all suggest people deal with that? You know, for themselves. Rachel, how about you? Well, I think the very first rule is to not go to that shame place. Mm -hmm where if we've recognized that maybe we're not coping in the healthiest way, to not then make the leap to uh, self-abuse on that or self-judgment. Um, and so trying to set that aside and recognize that, okay, I'm not necessarily eating very well, not necessarily exercising, not necessarily, um, you know, being appropriate in my relationship with alcohol, or maybe I'm shopping like a crazy person. Uh, all of those things, just take a step back and, and recognize, is there a way where it can be modified? You know, even just small promises to self. Promise in the morning that I'll do 10 minutes of exercise. You know, make it something that you can achieve so that you're not allowing yourself to get into that cycle uh, of sort of blamey, shaming stuff that is not going to help you. So setting those tiny, tiny goals that you can truly control and really being kind to yourself in that, but also holding yourself accountable to that. And maybe even, you know, calling someone or Zooming someone and, and asking each other to help each other be accountable to some of those goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I would add that, you know, as people of faith, we, we offer grace, we, we receive grace and mercy from the divine. And, and how can we offer that to others? And how can we offer it to ourselves? Like Rachel was saying, being gentle with ourselves. And noticing, you know, if you live with other people, they'll be very quick to tell you when you're behaving that way. <laughs> and so how, how do we take yeah. that as a sign for us? It, you know, what I would say to clients is that's really information. That's, yeah. it's not bad. It's not good. It's, it's information that tells us, wow, there's something else going on here that I need to explore. So listening to other people, uh, you know, in a reasonable way and, and how does it feel in your body? What is your body doing? You know, I love that, that connection that Rachel made with the body because exercise helps in so many ways, just even walking outside, you know, some people like to garden, uh, other people just like to walk the dog or just be in the sun when it, when it shines up out here. <laughs> um, so just noticing things in your body that are happening as well. Um, that, like I was saying about the, the signs of grief, you know, like not sleeping well or sleeping too much, that's a sign of your body, you know, feeling restless, listless, you know, signs in your body. Uh, I, I would also say that um, practicing stress relief whenever you can and whatever that looks like, even to the point of making a small list of, mm -hmm. of things that you can do that when, when you're feeling that come in your body or, or someone says, gosh, you know, you're being a jerk, <laughs> go to that list and go, okay, maybe I need to call a friend. Maybe I need to go to, into the bathroom. Like if you have young children, go into the bathroom with a lock and take a very long bath and tell your, you know, tell your partner if you have one. Yeah. You know, whatever. Um, I got it. I have to get away. Whatever you need to do to decompress and get a little bit of, of space for yourself, uh, I think is really important. Um, trying to connect with your life's purpose and what gives life meaning, I think is really important right now. As I see people who have lost their jobs, I mean, my, my husband uh, 
free, you know, freely has given me permission to share, you know, he's a professional musician and his meaning is music and he can't make it in the way that they, they make it. And, and, and he does classical music. So it's really particular. So finding meaning in this type of world about doing the thing that you're passionate about and how can you adapt that is really important for all of us. Um, you know, if we rely on our job for identity, how do we, how do we get to the, the root of what is meaningful to us in our lives? And how do we take those values into whatever the world is becoming and whatever we're becoming in the, in this world? Terry, I, oh, yeah. sorry. No, I'm I'm sorry. Gonna, I, I, go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, I was just going to quickly add um, that uh, the people who I've seen be the have the most difficulty with everything we're talking about are the people in the helping professions, whether those are ministers or our EMTs and police and fire people, nurses, doctors, all those folks who are really used to taking care of others as a profession, mm -hmm. as professional people really driving themselves to, to critical points of stress and compassion fatigue mm -hmm. because of sort of this real challenge in what they do to, to find any kind of balance or self-care at all. So people who have those folks in their families or as their friends, you know, even just calling up and not necessarily asking the question, how are you, which can immediately kind of set up a bit of a barrier or, or brain explosion, but <laughs> you know, just kind of asking, what are you finding helpful for right now? Or what are you finding meaningful right now? Or when was the last time you laughed and what happened? What caused you to have a moment of joy? And just, just asking those curiosity questions to help them reflect on that. Mm -hmm. you know, I, think, I think part of it, um, you know, it is that this is intensely stressful. Yeah. Right. So we are under an intense amount of stress. And you can think that you're all tough <laughs> or whatever. But this, there's a lot of stress happening out there. Yeah. And there's a lot of stress happening in us. And it would actually be quite surprising if we didn't experience that in a very profound way. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, so part of it is, you know, being overwhelmed is a part of the human experience. Yep. It's not like, it's not a sign of weakness. It like it is a, a baked into the cake of being human. Right. And, and so I, I think, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's, just just realizing that and knowing that it's going to happen uh, to us we're experiencing it is kind of a relief i think yeah. Yeah. you know today i i went out and sat on some steps uh, by some little purple flowers <laughs> and i watched two kinds of bees some honeybees and then a bumblebee uh kind of you know going in and, and just like having fun you know eating and, and getting the nectar and the pollen and stuff and and it, i can't remember the last time i've done that Mm. It just sat on the step in the sun with mm. a little bit of a breeze and watched watched these beautiful creatures do their little dance. Yeah. You know, and, and that got me thinking about, well, because I started looking at this Wuhan thing like back in December. Mm. I got some first word from a friend of mine who has family in China. <laughs> and so I've been like stressing about this thing since early, you know, since early January. And I thought for, and for a while, I was just taking in so much news about it and processing so much information, you know, but, um, but the reality is all that's stressful. And, and, it, and of course, it's going to overwhelm from time to time. And I just hope people who are listening either now or, or later uh, can just give yourself a break. Because it is going to be, it just is going to be stressful and overwhelming sometimes. And and, and how is that stress that individuals are experiencing being expressed in homes? I know we talked earlier about how some, some abuse in homes and violence in homes is, is on the increase, but what are some ways that it's being expressed in relationships? Yeah, so you mentioned earlier about the go, Danae, will you talk to like that squeaking out the side a little bit and what couples? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in my therapy practice, I have a lot of people who were fine before this and, oh. and had flown and, you know, got their wings and they all have come back. So <laughs> what I'm hearing from them is, you know, at, at home, everybody has different, they have a different living space. They have a different configuration of family, whether that's individual with or without a pet, uh, couples with or without, without children, 
other configurations, roommates, all sorts of things, different people who come from different families of origin and are, de are dealing with stress very differently. And now you're all in one house or one apartment. Um, you know, I know people that just had babies for the first time and like had, had a baby right, right the first week that COVID hit and the not, not being able to rely on community, you know, family, friends, the other people that they were all excited about sharing this new life with and you're in a house and you're trying to figure it out. Uh, so all of those things and then not having access to the services that we're used to having access to in the ways that we're used to having access to them, mm -hmm. like healthcare services and other, other service providers, sure. you know, even just going to the store is different now and very stressful for many people. That's yeah. what I've been hearing. So just all those little ways and, folks that are typically, you know, working uh, full time outside of the home and have children, their children are all at home. And they're having to not only do their work that they're expected to do if they were fortunate enough to have a job that you could do that. But they're also expected to help homeschool their children with the help of, of course, the school districts and other places. But it's just, it's all too much. It's all overwhelming. And so those are the, those are those places where it's unexpected. It's that unexpected ripple effect um, that people are experiencing within relationship. And, you know, you, you love your spouse or you love your children or you love your dog, you know, but being all together all the time, it just exposes any of those cracks and, and how, and how fragile sometimes intimate relationships can be. Does that, I hope that answers it. That's that a lot. Great. It's that a lot. Great. There's a lot going on there. <laughs> There's a lot happening in our lives. Rachel, what do you think? Yeah, again, I keep coming back to this, these situations with intergenerational homes as well, where, you know, some of the expectation of grandparents being able to take care of those younger <laughs> children is not there. And so just struggling for child care and struggling for um, what is the new role that we each might have in the family unit? Um, even just coming home after a long day's work for those who do have it, and even recognizing that those who are maybe staying at home are busier than ever before, the expectations around meal preparation <laughs> and laundry, those simple tasks suddenly become pretty huge. And so it really does behoove us to sit down and make those lists of stress that Danae was talking about uh, that had become so magnified. Mm -hmm. We can have a, a conversation, you know, as family or as couples about how can we together come to some solutions because we cannot do things and have the expectations uh, that we've had before. It's just, it's not going to happen. It's like World War II. Mm -hmm. Suddenly when the men were gone and the, the women took on a whole lot more, uh, so it's it's a similar thing. It's like the, the kids need to suddenly maybe take on responsibilities that they haven't been asked to before, and they're growing up rather quickly, I, I think, and being asked to, and, and they, that parents might feel bad about. But yet, the truth is, the kids aren't going to have um, the idyllic little childhood we thought that they should, and our senior graduates are not going to have their moms and their graduation. So, so what can we do? And I've seen some lovely kinds of solutions to that. Um, everything from a dad who was a carpenter kind of being able to make a little stage for graduation in their driveway to another dad uh, kind of turning their front porch into uh, a, a place to have a little prom you know, with, between his daughter. You know, so, so there's some fun ways. Uh, but again, it really does also mean letting go of the image in our head at every age in that household about well, how we thought it was supposed to. And that's part of the grief, mm -hmm. something different, and it can be just as wonderful. And I think we're laying down some memories that are actually quite unique and amazing. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I think, part, I think part of it for families too is, uh, for people in, in, in a home, is, is to try to set up a little bit more of a, of a pattern during their week. Mm -hmm. Because you know, anticipation uh, for all of us is very powerful. 
Um, and so if we can anticipate that on Sunday evening, we're turning off all the TV and the news and on stuff, and we're going to light a few candles and sit around and talk, or we're going to go out for a walk that evening, and we're not going to discuss, you know, the pandemic and COVID-19 and other things like that. Um, or, or we're going to have a, a Zoom call with our family on a Saturday evening or something like that. Just setting up a, a little bit of a pattern. Mm -hmm. Because human beings don't do real well when everything is just chaotic and, and all that kind of stuff. I think, I think finding a new pattern is really important. And of course, when it changes again, we're going to grieve that pattern too. <laughs> I, I think you're right, Terry. I, people who suddenly have rediscovered puzzles, yeah. families can work on, and board games, yeah. and conversations. I, I think people are going to kind of walk out of that saying, you know what? Let's do yeah. let's a family night where that's what we do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and I I'm an Adlerian trained therapist, and one of our and one of our family types of techniques is that we we tell people to have family meetings. And if you've ever seen the show Super Nanny, um, it's a it's a show about a nanny coming into chaos, and then they bring you know they bring order to you know the family. It's exactly what you're saying, Terry Having a schedule, you know, and when you have a family meeting, you can talk about what what is our week what is our day going to look like what is our week going to look like what is our month going to look like putting it out on paper vi people are visual like we need to have it written on paper taped up or written on a whiteboard however you want to do it but have it in a visual way so everybody can feel the safety of at least we kind of have certain anchors throughout the day throughout the week and knowing that uh, things might change a little bit, but for the most part, we always, you know, we're going to be doing school at nine o'clock, then we'll have, um, you know, our morning walk or, you know, whatever. Um, and even for those of us that are working at home, how do we take breaks? How, how do we work all of that type of thing in? Um, one, one thing that I think is really helpful, especially when you live in a small place and, and have to share space with another person who's working or children that are, that are doing their schooling is having um, a box or some other kind of tray or something where when you are done with your work, you stack it in that box and you put that box aside so that, you know, if that living area is also your eating area or whatever, it can still remain family, a family area and not just work. I because see. I think also what has happened is people, everything's bleeding all over. So how do we contain it the best we can? And, and just actually just literally containing our work is really, I think it's a significant uh, symbol and it's really helpful to just go, okay, there's my work box. I'm going to put this over here and I will not return to that until the next morning or until the, or until the kids are in bed and I can yeah. do, you know, finish X, Y, Z. So you know, having zones for work and for play and, and having a work box or whatever is really, really helpful. And at the family meetings, you can talk about things that need to be addressed, but also share what went well this week. Mm -hmm. And those things like Rachel was talking about, about how, what, what do we want to take into the future? Do we want to continue to have family puzzle night or, you know, whatever that may be. And then each week plan something rewarding for, for yourselves and your family each week. Whatever that looks like with whatever phase of, <laughs> of reopening or not that we're in, but plan something that has nothing to do with anything else that's going on in, in, inside COVID land, you know? Whether it's a walk in the park somewhere else or, you know, physically distance visit with some friends or family, however that is. And then after you have your meeting, do something fun right after that. Do a puzzle. Do something that is engaging and is, is not about everything else that's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, you know, just to just to add to that, I think, you know, part of it too, I, I used to, you know, when I did premarital counseling, you know, I would always I would ask a, a the, the couple to each list out a month, their mm -hmm. ideal month you know, including work, including, you know, time together, including time apart. And so I think, you know, part of this is, is helping uh, people say, uh, three days a week, I need to go for a walk by myself. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean I don't love you. Mm -hmm. It just means I need some time by myself as well, you know, yeah. 
And uh, so I think, you know, mixing that, those sort of different social needs together is really important uh, as well. Jerry, I, I want to add an example that of those two things that I think can be helpful. Uh, it, what you just said, sort of taking time out and being real clear about space, as Danae was saying, and then also adding something, a third thing, which is, you know, we can kind of collapse on uh, all ourselves and our needs in the immediate environment. And one of the things that, that I think can be helpful that people are kind of doing intuitively is, who else can I help? <laughs> you know? Outside of here, who else can we? And, and so people are coming up with creative ways, whether it's making PPE that they're sending on to other communities or, or healthcare workers. And so there's lots of ways to identify to do that. So, so here's something that I'm looking forward to in June for myself, which is uh, the, for example, the Australia Zoo, because it's not, it's closed, it's not able because of COVID-19 to get its usual ticket funding and things like that. It still is doing this important work with wildlife recovery. Uh, and, and I love the work that they're doing because the Australia wildfire ha just happened in January. And we're still rehabilitating animals. So they're doing this camp outdoors and raise funds. Uh, so in the week of June, I'm going to be trying to raise some funds to send to Australia Zoo, uh, but I'm going to be doing the backyard camp out, and I'm saying to my husband, when I'm out there, you can't come out there. <laughs> I'm in my camp, <laughs> and, and, uh, it, and also it just gives me a break. I'm, I'm going to let go of all the electronics and the connection with uh, my parish, my work, and I'll have things substitutes in place for all that, but as far as I'm concerned, it's like I'm going out to Australia in my brain <laughs> and I'm gonna just focus on a different place and a, and a different need and, and also get some respite for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the deepest uh, teachings, you know, in, in, uh, in all the, the Abrahamic faiths, but in many faiths is that when you're feeling a sense of scarcity, which I think many folk are experiencing right now, you need to give a little bit away. Yes. Right, um, that not, and I'm, I'm not talking about the kind of turning God into a slot machine thing that our TV preachers uh, talk about, but but finding a way to, to give some portion of, of our own uh, time and talent and, and even our finances uh, to others more more in need of them. Um, so so just to kind of move the conversation a little bit more long term now for a minute, you know, what are some of the long term effects that that we could be having both positive and, you know, challenging um, uh, uh, due to this stressful time. Rachel, what do you think about that? Well, well, I would think we've said earlier that we're really in the midst right now of a trauma event. It's long term. It's like a slow motion accident. We don't know the outcomes yet. Uh, and, and just the emotional stress coming from being in the midst of that. I could well imagine that some of the long-term effects, especially for our frontline people, are going to be genuine PTSD. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're all experiencing emotional stress. It's not PTSD, <laughs> but we can have people at the end of this really suffering and processing um, from such a protracted, prolonged period of exposure to stress. So really being on the, on the lookout for some of that, because we've already seen people from the front lines um, committing suicide. We've, we've seen um, the stress in families uh, and, and communities that have exploded. Um, and, and I think we're also going to see our, our, our frontline people in EMTs and police departments trying to figure out what was that all about. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I do think that there is going to be a long-term sort of reflective process of um, what did we do? What, what did we contribute that was uh, that we find valuable. What are the what are the takeaways that are going to be meaningful? And for some people, it's just going to be one giant accident, and they're going to need to have processing around that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the long term negative effects um, c is something that we really need to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's just so much that we don't know. I mean, there's there's things that are very clear that are that are happening, but that again, that ripple effect is going to run length, you know, it's length and, and it is going to run deep. And we are, we're not even, you know, even two years from now, we're mm -hmm. going to still be dealing with different effects of it on all sorts of different levels, economic, and then, emotional. Yeah, and then today you add on the losses of key people in the family. Mm -hmm. 
was the, the matriarch or patriarch or the, the breadwinner or, you know, on and on, or the child. So, so, so people are going to be processing those losses in the context of a, of a national and global trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not being able to use the anchors that they normally used, which like in our, in the Christian tradition and in other faith traditions, funerals. Yeah. Yeah. Weddings. I do a lot of premarital counseling. I just had a couple whose wedding venue had to cancel because of, you know, what's yeah. happening in the world. And that was their dream. And yeah. now their dream has died, in, at least in that way. I mean, at the end of the day, it's important that they just get married, but they had a whole idea. But yeah. also, you know, when we're grieving and we need to mourn, we need to bring that, that internal grief outward having a funeral is going to look different now. It's not going to be the same as well, gathering. And, and, and Danae, uh, at, like on one hand, there's a family who's, you know, trying to cope with what does the funeral look like down the road? And mm -hmm. then like, okay, I represent the ministers who are working in parishes right now, just right now today. And like you said, we're only partway through this. I have 11 funerals backed up. Yeah. Most of those are normative uh, but but several of those have been impacted by COVID-19. Yep. So only one of those 11 have we been able, using all those protocols with a limited group of people, to actually enter into a columbarium. Mm -hmm. Still are looking toward when we're going to have this memorial service, and that may not be till next year for most of these people. So the, uh, just looking at the clergy who life is already busy, uh, we're in the midst of high-level adaptations. We're looking toward the end of the year at Christmas time, and I can tell you that the moment we get to be able to schedule these funerals, I'm going to have them every single weekend. Yeah. I'm not alone. So yes. I would say to bishops and pastoral care providers and colleagues, how can we support one another in that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because our future our long-term scope here is, is still looking pretty stressful for a while. Yeah, definitely. You know, and yet I think, I think it's also true that these kinds of times can, can help us kind of reassess who we are, or what we do value, what we want to be about in the world. Yep. Um, you know, uh, what do you all think about, you know, how, how can we, even though we're in the middle of the stress, right, we're in the middle of the stress event, and, and we have no idea of, uh, when it when it begins to change, yeah. um, I won't say end, right? But right. when it when it begins to change, and and uh, what are some things we can kind of think about or, or or do, or what kind of attitudes can we bring to this that allows us to come out the other end with with um, you know with, with some wisdom and some depth of character and some greater compassion? What do you all think about that? Yeah, I have likened this to the refiner's fire. You know, that it really feels like that opportunity to, to be discerning about what is really the essence of our lives, individually, in our faith communities, and on a global scale. And what do we really value, and how can we do more of those things living into the future? I think this has stripped away a lot of the chaff and, and really helped as it's a painful mirror sometimes, but it's really helping us to look clearly at who we are and, and what really can be important and what, what, what we can do for the earth, for each other, for ourselves and our relationship with the divine. And I also think, I also get the impression, uh, what came to mind was if you ever watch Doctor Who, if anyone knows what that show is, <laughs> It's this guy who travels through time and, and helps, you know, save Earth all the time. Anyway, but he, when he regenerates, he regenerates into a different person. And he, and it's the same parts, but it's different. And so I, I kind of see us regenerating and, and every time Doctor Who regenerates, He's a little loopy <laughs> at first and is trying to figure out who he is and, or now it's a she, the doctor is a she, um, you know, and who she is or who he is, or who they are. And, um, and it's just, it's this, it's this real tender space. And so I feel like that's, we're just, we're regenerating. We're trying to figure out all the parts are there. We just have to figure out how they're configured now. And that takes time and it takes again, grace and mercy 
for ourselves and for each other and it takes connection and community to remind ourselves who we really are. So Terry, you said in the introduction, um, you graciously pointed out uh, an Anglo heritage that I have and a First Nations heritage that I have. And um, one of the things that is coming out for me, uh, and I think I'm going to be taking on into the future, is the, the strength from the, both of those sides. Uh, when I look back at the history, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I'm feeling very, very connected to family stories that didn't necessarily have a lot of meaning for me before mm. sort of national global uh, stress or moment. Uh, because I, I remember hearing stories on the Anglo side of my family of a great grandmother as a child, uh, welcoming back returning soldiers from the Civil War by being out in her front yard with her mom, helping to give them cups of water. They walked to home. Uh, so, and then remembering the kind of the, the strength of that and the, and, the, and the touchstone to what becomes a very significant national moment. Uh, and then also on my, my native side, remembering just generations of um, having to, to, to really cope with, with so much and devastating losses and so much illness. My great grandmother was killed by smallpox um, that was intentionally introduced. And so you know, realizing that people, my people on both sides have, have gone through these things before or I wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. So I have in me, and I think we all have in us, stories like that from our families that we now recognize as more relevant and more essential to our identity that have equipped us with strength and heritage and roots and longing and, and we can survive this because we're here <laughs> and, and and our nation as devastating and as hard as all this feels right now is as, as um the, the wonder that comes to us about how how will our nation even look at the end um i think these kind of uh, moments of, of being in the fire, being in the furnace, as you were saying, the refiner's fire, will hopefully make us more aware even nationally and globally of, of what we want because we're seeing what we don't. Mm -hmm. And I think that we will come out of this much more clear <laughs> as, as people who are members, who are citizens of what our responsibilities and obligations are. You know, I think that's, that fits so well into the kind of the, the next question here, which is, you know, we know that, um, you know, we've known for a long time about wealth and income inequality and how it's been increasing for the last 40 years. Um, we, we know about, in, as a culture, we're learning more about structural racism mm -hmm. and institutional racism. Um, not only historically, but as it's expressed in our own in our own uh, time, um, we know, you know that that the that, that the impact of COVID, both in terms of health, but also in terms of the economic impact, is not being shared evenly across our society. Right. You know, and and so all of that's that's true. The the inequities that are being that we're seeing just. That we that are just in our face now in a way that maybe they weren't societally before. Um, so how do we have compassion for ourselves as we're going through this? But how do we also have our hearts broken open as individuals and as society um, to have compassion for those that are more impacted than ourselves? Because I think a lot of times those two are opposed. Mm -hmm. Like I either have to care for them or I have to care for myself. Like how do you all see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the whole, the two images that come to my mind when you're talking about that is that the first image is, you know, people fighting one another over rolls of toilet paper in the, <laughs> the shop early on. And, and then, then the other image is what's going on in Navajo land nation right now and, right. and other tribal areas where uh, those equity inequities are, are really becoming backlit. Um, and, and the education that people are now receiving nationally around the fact that Navajo land right now per population it is three times, it is the third highest in our nation for new instances of COVID exposure and death. Third, they have, they represent, Native Americans represent 2% of our American population. So, so that gross inequities right there 
lack of running water to be able to preserve hygiene with a, a very low level um, ability for their current health care, which is provided by the government, uh, you know, by treaty, never been adequate. So people are responding. What gives me a lot of heart is the national level of response. When people found out what's going on in the in the tribal areas, they've really responded with everything from, you know, first line people showing up to help with masks and supplies and food, um, and, and just really empowering the people to help each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I keep going back to that that commandment from Jesus, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. What is that? I mean, we are having to really face that. And what does that mean in a time of a pandemic? Um, and since we can't control what other people are thinking or feeling or doing, we can only control ourselves, you know, doing what, what, what our, what our faith traditions, whatever they may be, are, are saying, you know, about the stranger, the neighbor, you know, who is our, who is our neighbor? That's the kind of thing I feel like we have the opportunity to focus on right now and to, to be able to tap into that in order to have compassion for, for all. And that includes people that are less impacted too, because I think that is, that's a hard space too. You know, when, when we see people that are not behaving the way that we would um, on either side of that, I think that's, that's really hard to hold compassion for all. And so um, how can we continue to tap into our faith traditions and what they teach us in order to do what's right in front of us? And Terry, too, I think one of the things that really is highlighted is um, what we're calling essential workers. Uh, and some of them, a lot of those people are immigrant folks or and a lot of those a subsector of illegal immigrants and and who are highly challenged to get access to health care and the things that they need and even finances are ineligible for any of the federal aid uh, and yet they're hesitant to come out and say hey I'm a person who is ineligible and I need aid so so the ways that churches and other groups uh, nonprofits can help is you know providing a mechanism where people can just simply request aid, <laughs> uh, especially our, our immigrant and our people of color population, uh, to, who we do need. There are people who are who are our janitors in our healthcare systems, who are making the infrastructure continue uh, in this critical time, and are most overlooked. So, just even asking the question, do you, do you have what you need? <laughs> are you eligible for any of these supports? Mm -hmm. Identify where else they can go. Well, and a lot of folks that are in that position are, are very nervous about the whole public charge, you know, rules yeah. that the current administration put, has been putting in place, which is that if you've ever received money, you know, from the federal or state or local government, then you cannot become yeah. a U.S. citizen That's right. uh, without paying that back, which would be just, just crazy. I think, I think you just can't even become. So there's a lot of fear out there, which all, all of course, brings up, you know, part of the trauma here, which is that uh, at least that I'm experiencing is that is that our again our public systems and our public leadership uh, feels like it's not focused in, in at least in the national realm, uh, um, and that's uh, that is so um, it, it's reminding me how important uh, government is, a uh, public leadership is, public policy is. As that's we right. had, uh, yeah. And it's like they're intentionally taking advantage to uh, make sure as many brown people die as possible, uh, as many incarcerated people die as possible, um, as many immigrants waiting uh, on our borders die as possible. Uh, they're, they're, it's just, it's almost like this genocidal tactic at this point. And when you have white supremacists wandering around fully armed in the courthouses without any kind of uh, consequence for that. Yeah. It just continues to send a message that uh, people of color should be afraid, very afraid. Uh, so so <laughs> the, the, the whole kind of thing is where, where can churches or other groups step up with a, with a um, at least an equal uh, visibility? And on that, I would really look to uh, the coverage that is provided in the news. Um, when we talk about fair and balanced, well, 
stop focusing on um, the, the whack jobs who are only sowing division and look for those stories that are in our um, towns and, and, and communities that are really focused on bridging and outreach and uh, selfless acts of determination for, for unity in a time of national crisis. You know, I, I really appreciate you. And, and let's uh, let's go ahead and end it on that note, because I think this is a time when we need to be lifting up, you know, positive stories as well as, as some of the challenges. And, and I, on a future show, I hope to have on some of the, 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 the faith communities, the wisdom communities that are, that are out there doing this work right now um, and who, who need uh, some, some support, both uh, in terms of our physical presence and capacity, but also in terms of dollars uh, to meet some of those needs. Uh, because our, our traditions are very clear that, that we are to love our neighbor, but especially our neighbor that's vulnerable. Yeah. Because that's how we build, you know, a stronger community. So I just want to thank, you know, Danae, you and Rachel both for a really great conversation tonight. And to everybody who's, who's listening tonight, thank you uh, so much for joining us. Um, next week, we're going to, we're going to have uh, um, Anila Afzali, Alana Suskin, and Hamza Khan to talk about um, stories from the ground of fighting Islamophobia and, um, and anti-Semitism and kind of what we're learning uh, as we try to do that work out in the world. Uh, so please join us next week at the same time. If you want to learn more about our, our uh, organization, you can go to pathtounderstanding.org. Uh, remember the Challenge 2.0 is hosted by Jeff Renner. It's on our YouTube channel and on Sunday mornings on uh, MeTV at 7.30 in the mornings. And that we're continuing our Facts Over Fear campaign to counter anti-Muslim bigotry. That's on Facebook and Instagram. And just encourage all of you to be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, Terry. Thank, Thank you, you Terry.